Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso. Today's episode is an audio-only episode with Patrick Krupa. Now, Patrick Krupa, also known as Lord Digital, is an American writer, hacker, and activist. Krupa was a member of the legendary Legion of Doom and Cult of the Dead Crow hacker groups and co-founded Mindvox in 1991 with Bruce Vancher. He was a heroin addict from age 14 and to 30 and got clean through the use of the hallucinogenic drug Ibogaine. In fact, Patrick, I believe, was one of the first people to ever start an internet service providing company back in the 90s. He was an old school phone freaker and also was one of the first people to ex successfully heal a heroin addiction with Ibogaine and he was among the first people to ever explore microdosing Ibogaine. Now, this podcast actually has little to nothing to do with Ibogaine at all. Initially, Patrick and I were meeting up to record a podcast and he was having some issues with his tech and we just didn't end up recording the podcast. But I did end up having the record function on as we just started talking and we ended up starting talking about cognitive enhancers. So surprisingly, this one goes pretty deep and very casually uh, into cognitive enhancers and in particular, a active, uh, sorry, a, a peptide called BPC-157. Now, I wanna be clear that things like peptides and cognitive enhancers, you know, same with this podcast in general when it comes to psychedelic drugs. I feel like if we don't speak openly about taboo subjects, then we can't we can't dissolve our ignorance. And if we don't dissolve our ignorance, we're just bound to ultimately harm ourselves in the long run. There's something special about nootropics and peptides, which is that a lot of the time they're in a fairly delicate legal gray area. So these are things that things that we're talking about aren't necessarily illegal, such as many of the psychedelic drugs that we talk about, but they are in a very legal gray area. Be extremely cautious with what you choose to do with the information that you are going to receive in this episode. Also, before this podcast begins, this episode was brought to you by my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed in the upper corner to this episode upper corner of this video on YouTube and listen in the description to this episode. Thank you very much. And thank you to those of you who are leaving one-time PayPal or crypto donations. If you have yet to become a patron or leave a donation and you are goddamn stoked on this content, or at the very least, you're like, you know, moderately pleased by it. And you'd like to, you know, echo back some sort of, uh, you know, pat on the back. You can do so financially through a donation or by becoming my patron on Patreon. Links to do so are contained in the description to this episode. Thank you. This is the first, but it will not be the last you hear of me and Patrick. Him and I had such a great rapport. Actually ended up recording another uh, episode, the official episode, which will come out in a few weeks. And we have plans to record another one. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation with Patrick Krupa here on Adventures Through the Mind. Enjoy. I have a quick question for you, though, and I am re I'm yeah. recording this uh, because okay. I started recording it when you introduced the idea, and then I was like, eh, maybe not, uh, which is that uh, BPC-157? What the hell? Is that really? Did, have you tried it? Does it work? <laughs> like, where do I get some? Uh, um, the, the answer to, to, to all those questions is yes, and it's not that hard because, you know, the, the internet thing is kind of like your friend there. Right. It's what, what happens with a lot of people uh, who, never mind being drug dependent or whatever <laughs> other issues you may have. You're just, you're a human being and you're getting older and you're starting to you know, experience the wear down and falling apart of various systems within your body. PPC is, you know, body protective compound 157. And it's, uh, it's it, the big word for it is it's a pentadecapeptide, which just means it's a it's a it's a protein that's got 15 amino acids. That's the pe pentadeca part. Right, right, um, right. Basically, a, a peptide is uh, just you know one or more. It's basically like at least two amino acids connected together to make this building block. Growth hormone, for instance, is 191 separate elements that create that one structure 
uh, BPC is only 15 amino acids. And what it seems to do is essentially heal almost everything that is going wrong with your body. Now, that, everything is a little bit all-encompassing. I mean, it's not like it cures cancer or it – it very well may, actually. We don't know. But basically, it significantly alleviates pain – which is one of the reasons why uh, people do narcotic analgesics and opioids in the first place, because they have chronic pain. If you have arthritis, if you have tendon injuries, if you basically just live your life uh, on a daily basis and experience chronic pain, BPC appears to be remarkably effective at reversing that damage and curing it mm. and the interesting thing is thus far in all of the literature that exists if you look at the monographs that have been published like on pubmed i mean there, there there's a wide spectrum of them uh, some of them use human beings a lot of them are using animal models but essentially a single course of bpc which lasts for let's say 10 days to four weeks will promote healing and then this state where you've been healed will stick around mm. you, you don't have to keep taking it forever it's not like maintenance there there's there's a wide assortment of interesting peptides but bpc appears to be the only one which actually just fixes things and then you don't need to keep taking it mm. And one of the interesting things that's extraordinarily fascinating is with stimulant uh, users, people who like, for instance, methamphetamine or smoking crack, both of which are incredibly damaging to your brain and your body. <laughs> I yeah, mean, yeah. The, the, the only thing that's worse or as bad as those two is being a chronic long-term alcoholic. That, that, that one's also incredibly bad for what what is doing to your brain and basically causing damage we can't fix but right, the right. Thing anything that damages the liver like systematically just damages the whole body it it can and it often does it's just that stimulants are very harsh the, the interesting thing is uh bpc appears to have uh, quite a bit of efficacy for people who are, are stimulant users trying to stop or mm. trying to minimize damage or especially with the individuals that I've interacted and worked with. Okay, you've done Ibogaine, you have rebooted your habit, you're cleaned up, you're in a state that you would like to try to maintain and you know, you may have cravings. Uh, microdosing Ibogaine can certainly be very effective in helping with that. But the idea is to use whatever is available to you and has efficacy and works. And BPC-157 does seem to work for methamphetamine and uh, other stimulant abusers. It will regenerate... Uh, essentially parts of your brain that are not working at an optimal level. I mean, if you've been doing stimulants for a long time, your dopamine receptors, your D1s, D2s, D3s, they're, they're trashed. Yeah. Ibogaine helps to repopulate those and sort of ignites this chain of healing that takes place at fast forward. BPC seems to synergistically work with that and augment it. <laughs> And that's, you know, okay, so that's, that's stimulant abusers, <laughs> that's, uh, that's people with, you know, chronic pain problems, but also, I mean, if you go to the gym and you lift something without warming up the wrong way, you, your ligaments hurt, your tendon hurts, you, all of these things, BPC appears to, well, let's, let's put the word cure in quotes because I'm very leery of the word cure right, as applied yeah. to anything. Yeah. <laughs> but it certainly helps. And it's extraordinarily cheap. And of course, you know, there's very little incentive to ever bring peptides 
into the the wider marketplace for the most part because most of them cannot be patented. I, I don't know exactly what's occurring with BPC in terms of trying to bring it to the market right now because you know it's a it's a synthetic it's a it's a peptide that does not naturally occur within uh, within nature. So there's some possibility there, but it's a really fascinating compound, and perhaps the the coolest thing about it is uh, there have been literally no negative side effects reported, either anecdotally, uh, anecdotally, like online, or in the literature. And so that's pretty remarkable. That's a pretty amazing safety profile so far. Well, speaking of safety profile, I, I had seen what normally I would right away be like, oh, there's no way this is real, but just a whole lot of positive and nobody having any sort of like major, you know, uh, contraindications of taking it at all. And then, I mean, normally that sets off a little flag for me, but I'm increasingly more likely to believe it if the science is strong, which it seemed to be. But my concern then was about, and I've seen what the back end of a research chemical company can look like. And I am... The back end. Yeah, like the, like the administrative packing the bags side of things. And... I mean, it has, they have certain just, string, stringency, but my, my curiosity is when ordering a peptide that from what I understand, I have to inject into my body, like with a needle, I, like sub, um, subcutaneously, I'm not really too stoked on like how sterile is this peptide? What does it come in contact with? Yeah, I could mix it with, you know, bacteriostatic water, but um, like what's... Do I, should I be concerned about that? Like, how do I how do I track down a company? I mean, like, this is going to be publicly presented, so you can't really recommend yeah. doing this or whatever. But if somebody were to go looking, without directly telling them where to source it, what should they be cautious of? In so far as not getting something that might be might be not good to inject into your blood. Uh, under understood and the the answer is again uh <laughs> it's similar to where you would source other molecules there have been many quality control issues with that whole uh war on human beings i, right. I meant drugs issue yeah. and it's rather disturbing to inject something into yourself and not knowing its origins i prefer you know cgmp materials coming from uh, reputable labs if uh Basically, the you triangulate your information to the best of your ability to do so. So um, um, you look at monographs that have been published in PubMed. So, okay, that is mainstream science. You can look at, correlate that with personal anecdotal experiences, of which there are many. I mean, if you look up peptides, you look up BPC-157, you're immediately going to find like 10 or 15 uh, lay people who are either making some money by selling it or who are writing different long-form content Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. their experiences with it. And you will find a lot of people on various forums. And, you know, Google is your friend here. I mean, you're going to be presented with like 5, 10, 15 pages, all pointing you in a direction where there are individuals who are experimenting with BPC. And in these different places, you will find, well, depending on your geographic location, I mean, it's a little bit different if you're in the United States or if you're in Canada or you're the UK, you will see the same five to 10 companies mentioned again and again and again uh, with reference to peptides. And they're going to have uh, lab analysis, they're going to have uh, purity reports, they're going to have you know their lab certificates available online. Mm-hmm. And granted, all of these, everyone can make up anything about anything. So you're, you're never really assured of anything at all. Right. Like but the un- unregulated substance market is exactly that, unregulated. Yeah, that's exactly. That, that's, that's its downside. Mm-hmm. So you're never really sure. And yes, you do need to inject peptides. They're very fragile they tend to break down when you shake them up too much. They don't like heat. They don't like light. If you're going to store them for any extended period of time, you should freeze them because, you know, freezing 
any given molecule brings uh, molecular activity down to almost zero. So it's not degrading, it's not oxidizing. And then once it's reconstituted, like with bacteriostatic water, you would store it in a refrigerator. And peptides, you're pinning them. So, I mean, for not not to use slang, pinning means you're, you're injecting it subcutaneously into, right. into fat. You're not usually trying to IM it, which is intramuscular. You're just trying to hit a fat deposit. And you can go on YouTube and you can look up how to do an SC injection. You're going to find 900 videos of people demonstrating that. Right, right. It's similar and, It's similar to the way a person would inject insulin into their, exactly. their body. Exactly. Just like insulin, there are specific sites that you kind of have to shoot for. But in these peptides, you would do it more localized to the area you're trying to heal. Like For example, my issues would be, you know, chronic chronic damage to my shoulder and to my left knee because of <laughs> repeated very irresponsible but uh inevitably um the injuries so i got a little lost in my words there but injuries so i would be injecting it locally close to the site yeah i if if you have those those injuries yourself it might be quite interesting. I mean, I can talk to you when we're not recording and make a suggestion as to where to source something. But <laughs> um, basically, to carry out your own experiment and see how you feel before and after. Because uh, from my own subjective experiences, they have been uh, extremely and significantly positive. And the, the question of localized versus systemic is still being debated. I mean, there are a lot of people who use localized injections, like this is the body part where you're experiencing uh, damage or it hurts, so you try to hit as close to that as possible. There are other people who just inject subcutaneously any place that's convenient because theoretically the, the effects are systemic. Hmm. In my own observations, personally, I have discovered no significant difference if I localize injections or if I just use it systemically. Hmm. It just seems to work. Hmm. Very interesting stuff because the idea that I could be free of the chronic pain that I suffered because of the injuries that I incurred as a younger, much less responsible man um, – is really enticing is very enticing it's it, it's that's very understandable because you know i'm in the same situation i have not taken the best care of myself i'm, I'm approaching you know half a century and i spent uh you know we're talking about quality control i i, I was an i used heroin for 16 years and i was a very heavy iv user for over a decade mm -hmm. so that's in the neighborhood of ten to 15,000 rigs that I have sunk into my veins filled with what? Uh, oh, yeah, materials that I got off some guy standing on a street corner <laughs> who's fucked up enough to be standing on a street corner. Right. So yeah. that, that, that behavior is kind of, in, in retrospect, that's pretty suicidal. I mean, it's idiotic. Why are you doing this? I mean, the answer is because you're an addict. But it... I, th there's quite a bit of cumulative damage. So reversing as much of that as possible and healing it is, you know, one of my own priorities. And it comes up again and again and again with patients that we work with. And uh, BPC is one of those compounds that's just fascinating because it has so many positive qualities. And so far, we have found really no negatives, either anecdotally, personally, or within the literature. So that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty rare. Mm. Excellent. This was an excellent sort of like, uh, almost a podcast, not yet a podcast, soon to be a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, I mean, it, there's different materials that you can sort of stack together to get synergy i mean bpc is is one of those i mean uh, another one that has incredible efficacy for healing almost everything is growth hormone right i mean that one is more well known it's a it's a bit more complex i mean it's 191 amino acids well isn't injecting and growth hormone sort of on par with the idea of taking steroids that the steroids comes right after this one. That's so yes. Well, that's that's a 
that that's an interesting part of the pharmaceutical big pharma within the United States and the pharmaceutical lobby. Gr growth hormone was generally unknown to most people up until the near term past when a lot of hysteria came out about, you know, bodybuilders using growth hormone and uh, life extension people supporting it. And uh, they successfully got it regulated, so the scheduling is a, is a bit tighter and it's a little bit more difficult to source it and get doctors to prescribe it for you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're taking supra-physiologic doses of growth hormone, by which I mean to say, I mean, if you're taking 20 or 30 IUs a day, I mean, that's, okay, you know, it. Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, that they're not looking bad for 70-year-old men. <laughs> that's, that's not humanly possible without a lot of pharmaceutical assistance, yeah, part of which yeah. is, you know, growth hormone. But if you're taking two IUs to six IUs, you, you're basically bringing your levels of growth hormone back to a healthy 20-year-old. So your body is healing the damage that may have occurred. I mean, the whole process of aging and the whole process of, you know, damage is damage builds up and this process continues. Inflammation increases and you're trying to throw whatever you can at these different interlocking systems to slow them down or reverse the damage. And growth hormone is something that is extraordinarily effective at doing that. Um, one of the problems is that, again, big pharma within the United States has successfully sort of added in all this hysteria, dumped it in with AAS, which is androgen anab anabolic androgenic steroids, and you know turned it into a difficult substance to obtain. You need a doctor's prescription, which is not the hard part. The hard part is, okay, here's your doctor's prescription, and oh, P.S., here's your bill for 20K per annum in order to do growth hormones. <laughs> That's yeah. the hard part. Yeah, interesting. Be because your insurance company will not cover it. it. The FDA has approved it for a very narrow spectrum of conditions. You know, anti-aging is not one of them. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's something that works. So another thing that works are secretagogues, which uh, release growth hormone, and those are considerably less expensive. And they also have very similar effects. I mean, with secretagogues, you can get the equivalent of about two to eight IUs worth of growth hormone release if you stack a GHRP and a GHRH, which is... Uh, for instance, uh, Sir, Sir, Morellin, Sir Morlin or Sir Morellin, depending how you pronounce it, was one of the very first uh, secretagogues, and it's just the first 29 amino acids of growth hormone. Mm -hmm. And it, it enables, uh, well, subjectively and objectively, it appears to have most of the benefits of growth hormone itself, except instead of introducing something exogenous to your body you're causing your own body to secrete it endogenously you're just waking up systems and making them come online and uh sir Morlin is actually prescribed it's a prescription medication which was discontinued about i don't know a while ago because they wanted to supplant it with something called tessamorlin and but, but anyway, compounding pharmacies are able to make it for you, and uh, endocrinologists are able to write you scripts for that. That So that releases growth hormone. There's the second generation. Uh, the, the second generation peptides like GHRRP2, 6, LP morlin, these, these are all associated with, uh, with growth hormone release. And so, is, so it's GHB, right? Like GHB is associated with um, bringing you into deep sleep, which is has like uh, HGH release, but also that it it causes your body to secrete higher levels of it as well, too. Is that right? GHB, uh, yeah, essentially that that's that's something that's similar to all of this, but it's not a compound that anyone I'm aware of works with in an attempt to. Uh, get higher growth hormone release or 
basically for health reasons. I mean, GHP was a was a fun party truck back a couple of decades ago. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's around like uh, in in that regard too much anymore. But well, I think uh, that a lot of that had to do with a media campaign for it being a date rate drug. Date rate yeah. Drug. One of the podcasts I follow uh, that I really appreciate on this particular topic is called Smart Drug Smarts. And um, they did a whole episode on GHB and the doctor that they had on was talking about how it was <clears throat> really a miracle drug for a lot of people. I mean, there was a lot of issues that they didn't realize were about to come up around um, GHB addiction um, and yeah. withdrawal symptoms and stuff. But uh, initially it was it was a miracle drug and it wasn't until it had been um, un actually unjustly associated as a date rape drug that it got such a huge backlash that it ended up becoming um, much more restricted and sort of culturally stigmatized for its prescription. But I remember it talking about being good for, you know, healing the body. That's why it was and probably still is kind of popular inside of uh, the bodybuilding community, but also that it had something to do with your neurochemistry, where in, uh, a gene app that you does something to the process of rebuilding your dopamine and norepinephrine, I think the word I'm looking for is catecholine supplies, uh, and brings them up to the point where you stack much more than your body normally would. And I've, I haven't like gotten into this language in a while, but something along the lines of stopping end stage inhibition, like where your neurochemistry would be like, oh, we got enough. That's, that's all we need normally. So we won't produce any more, uh, but would instead uh, just keep building it and building it. And the research was showing that you would have, insofar as treating narcolepsy, which is that spontaneously falling asleep, um, right. catatonic the, or mu the, muscle. That, that's why we write half a ton of Adderall scripts for that. That's one of the conditions yeah. anyway that had an ADHD. Right, um, right. But, but the comment that they made was that um, uh, uh, like taking GHB before you go to sleep was more effective in controlling narcolepsy symptoms than taking modafinil when you woke up. That's interesting. Yeah. That's, that's entirely, everything that you just said sort of like rings true with my basic recollections of GHB. GHB is something I have personally not worked with and, you know, n nobody like within, within our group has worked with that in terms of interacting with patients. So I don't know, but it's certainly possible. And, its entire you know timeline from this is a something that's potentially extraordinarily beneficial to people to this is a horrible terrible banned substance i mean that that sounds about right mm -hmm. it's like okay let's start the hysteria going let's demonize it let's drive it you know underground let's destroy it that's kind of the same thing that happened with mdma mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the the story of many many helpful molecules. I mean, I don't personally have experience with GHB, so I couldn't I couldn't elucidate too much on it, but it's I definitely only have recreational experiences with GHB, uh, particularly as a very supportive agent in my um, in my sexual vigor. Yeah, so you, so you've had extremely effective to the point where uh, it's like a practice. Anytime I would take GHB and anytime I will take GHB with uh, with people, first off, I won't take it if I'm not with somebody who I can express myself sexually with because otherwise I get all sad and depressed that I can't express this vast like fucking virility. Uh, but also uh, we have a conversation in advance before anyone takes it. Like, okay, so this gets really sexual. Inhibition is basically gone. We need to each know what each other is willing to, how far each other is willing to go and not go, because when the time comes, we're going to want to have established those boundaries in advance, and collectively we can uphold them. But if we don't establish them in advance, they're just not going to exist, and possibly there will be some regret on the other side of that. So that sounds like a beautiful paradigm. I mean, that's a that's a very nice setting and set and sort of headspace to, to, to experiment with. Mm -hmm. That sounds good to me. It, uh, it that, certainly that has been. Yeah. And if it, if it does positive things for you, then that's awesome because that's, uh, uh, yeah, speaking of, uh, <laughs> in terms of en enhancing virility and sort of, you know, bringing back your enjoyment of life. The other one in this whole 
you know, trifecta of peptides and, and, and materials is that you mentioned. Well, anabolic steroids, mm-hmm. there's testosterone. Um, that's, uh, that's a big one for a lot of people who have been drug dependent, especially opioid dependent individuals. Your testosterone tends to be extraordinarily low after years or decades of being on uh, opioids or opiates. And uh, testosterone is another one of those very strange conditions, especially like within the United States. The, it, it, it used to be a long, a long time ago, like last year, if your testosterone was, let's say, 250 and you, nanograms per deciliter and you're uh, you know, an 18 to 20-year-old person, well, you're, you were off the charts low and you know, they were, a doctor would prescribe testosterone for you and probably do it not in the most optimal sort of way, but they would help you out and mm. you would alleviate a lot of your problems. Now, it's all of America in particular that I'm aware of the testosterone levels have steadily declined decade by decade. It's like America has no balls. It's everything. <laughs> it's, but this is literally true. I mean, it's yeah. funny, but sad, but it, it's just the, the new, so they adjusted the entire reference ranges downwards. So now, mm. you know, abysmally low is the new normal and mm. sorry, you can't write you any testosterone for that, but we give you an SSSRI and uh, some Viagra and that'll make you feel better about being depressed all the time and, uh, you know, and having no libido. Well, this, okay. Um, so I know what I'm about to say is a bit tangenting off your, off your vibe here. And I'm sorry about this, but I mean sure. that some people and maybe, you know, substantially, um, argue that this has to do with uh, xenoestrogens in the diet and it blocking uh, blocking the production or at least the binding of testosterone in the body. Do you know anything on that? And it, it being associated to foodstuffs, especially soy uh, and yeah. plastics. Yeah, I, I this is like one of the, the largest theories out there in terms of attempting to answer the question, like, why is this happening? Because mm-hmm. it's a huge population of people. It's not like isolated incidences. It's just everybody. It seems to be happening. And, you know, soy in particular has a tremendous push from the government, and it appears in almost everything. And it does not seem to be very compatible with uh, – decent testosterone levels and that certainly could be one of the things which contributes to you know the the problems that are happening i i don't i don't really have a firm conclusion on why this happens or why it happens to certain individuals and not others because i mean most of the people that that i work with and interact with have all been uh, long-term hardcore drug users so they're doing they're beating themselves up quite a bit they're doing a lot of damage to their body and to their health so they're they're not coming from an optimal state to begin with but this is you know something that affects everybody but the the bottom line is that increasing your testosterone levels to and and again i'm not talking super physiologic doses we're we're not attempting to attain, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or (laughs) Sylvester Stallone, or the idea is not to hulk out. The the idea is just to have a normal testosterone level, which is, let's say, 750 to 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. It, It doesn't even really matter what the total testosterone number is. What matters is what's your free testosterone. And you're shooting for something between 20 to 30. And uh, then the third part of that chain is your estradiol, your E2, which is estrogen. And for a male, you probably want in the 20 to 30 range where you feel relatively normal. And th- this, this is where it becomes very interesting, adjusting estrogen. Um, basically, you can take somebody who's like – What's your average day like? And they will tell you, well, I, I sat and I cried for two hours. I'm just very depressed and I'm really not happy with anything in my life. And I'm just acting like a moody, terrible person. I'm being an asshole for no reason. I don't even know why. I'm so bitchy at everybody. So, okay, that, that's your E2, dude. Just adjust that and all those feelings will go away. And 
on, on the obverse of that, there, there are people who experience, you know, the same set of symptoms, but it's like, why am I experiencing this? My testosterone level is very high. I just had it tested. I mean, I go do and do physical activity. I eat well. I'm doing all the right things. Why is this happening to me as well? Because your E2 is out of range for where it should be. When, when you tune E2, you will eventually find what your own personal state is that where you have good libido, you don't have depression, you have energy, and you just feel positive. And these are just very foundational things in terms of adjusting your physio physiology, adjusting your endocrine system, basically creating a foundation for a healthy space for your consciousness to reside within. So is, and, is, is the introduction of exogenous but bioidentical testosterone an effective way to lessen your E2? And the second part of that question is lessening it something that happens when you remove contributing factors that are increasing it and the body naturally just clears it out and you balance or is there something that you need to do specifically to kick it to kick it out of those binding sites and out of your bloodstream well there's a couple of answers to that and none of them apply to everybody because everyone right. is different everybody uh, is different yeah yeah, basically what works for me may be the exact opposite of what works for somebody else. A lot of this is mediated by something called SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin. Mm -hmm. And that essentially occupies your testosterone. So if your SHBG is very high, even if your testosterone is very high, then your free testosterone might be very low. You're shooting for a reasonable amount of free testosterone which is let's say within the 20 to 30 range and you're shooting for roughly the same for e2 and when you introduce exogenous testosterone into the system then your hpta will which is your you're your basically your metabolic axis will shut down your production of testosterone, mm. which may not be the greatest thing either. So there's this other thing called HCG, which can prevent that and keep your internal your internal testosterone supply kind of going. It pre preserves your FA. It, it, it basically keeps your body in a much healthier state. But in terms of adjusting E2, uh, there are SERMs, which are selective estrogen receptor modulators that can help with that, even without using testosterone. Clomid is one of those. And uh, there are AIs, which, which are not artificial intelligences. They're, they're aromatase inhibitors. Right, and right. Something, something like, like resveratrol, or, for example. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, re yeah. Re I mean, resveratrol is a wonderful just supplement in terms of uh, anti-aging and in terms of life extension and preventing or repairing a lot of different damage. And, and another one of those that's really fascinating is metformin, which we can maybe zoom to for a brief moment after after pivoting off of this one. But but basically, aromatase inhibitors, arimidex is an aromatase inhibitor. The, the whole thing is you, you can't figure this out on the internet. You need to get blood tests done and oh, you need to sure. see what your actual levels are. Now, the doctor that you get may have no idea what any of this means because the average endocrinologist, if you ask them how much time did you spend on let's say, testosterone replacement in men at, at med school, the answer will be, yeah, I don't know, four to six hours worth of classes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, we prescribe, uh, you know, 100 migs per week, one shot, that's it. You, you have to self-educate yourself uh, to the best of your ability to do so. Oh, but you need Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you need blood work. Uh, you need to know what the values are because otherwise you may be doing a lot of really harmful things instead of helpful things. You, you essentially need some sort of a compatible physician, uh, a clinician who is working with you and helping you attain the state that, you know, enables a very reasonable foundation. Um, 
you you mentioned resveratrol. I mean, one of the last things I wanted to just mention, at least briefly, while we're uh, while we're talking, is uh, is metformin. Pardon me, I just took a took a short drink there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we can take a little vape break if you need. <laughs> I know nicotine is good for the biohacking of your. It, uh, it is. Your I love nicotine. That's that's one of those things I like to hang on to indefinitely. And and <laughs> vaping is you know well it's harm reduction. I like nicotine. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's harm reduction. Yeah. Okay. Um, metformin is another one of those compounds which is. Uh, it, it, it's, I mean, it's a drug that was for type 2 diabetes, and it was uh, approved for use at some point in the 1950s in England. I think it took the FDA roughly another 35 to 40 years to approve it in the United States. And uh, it appears to have positive, positive effects on cardiovascular disease, on reduction of BMI, which is body mass index, basically how fat are you or how skinny are you. It appears to be neuroprotective. It appears to have anti-cancer properties. <laughs> it appears to that, that if you look up the research and uh, here I would not go to a bunch of forums. That goes straight to PubMed. Just look up the monographs that have been published regarding metformin. There is just an avalanche of extraordinarily positive results that this one molecule produces, and. The most interesting thing ever right now is that the FDA within the United States has approved TAME. TAME is the anti-aging metformin experiment. Hmm. And by doing this, the FDA has for the first time stepped up and stated that aging is a disease that we should maybe be trying to cure. Because mm -hmm. that's it. That's the purpose of their study. They're seeing what effects metformin has on aging. Right now, it's uh, you know a drug that's prescribed to people to manage type two diabetes, and uh, one of its main, most significant problems is that uh, a monthly supply costs about three dollars. So you know they're they're going to fix that. That's yeah. what they Should discovered. Probably uh, get on that soon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Once they discover that, you know, metformin does extend lifespan and it does reverse the damage in all these different systems, they're going to come out with metformin plus now with blue food coloring. Right, did, right. Did we say 20 cents a pill? We, we meant $750 each. Uh, um, didn't that's... the U.S. government try to like clamp down on that happening with pharmaceutical companies when that one company dramatically increased the price of AIDS medication a few years ago? Well, that was that was um, I, I I remember that. That was that one guy who was not very not very likable. Um, I, I the U.S. government does random things. Seemingly, it's it's actually really difficult to say the the FDA is good or bad because it's just like this gigantic dinosaur dragging itself through a tar pit. There are so many different organizations and groups within the FDA. I mean, right. for instance, the pilot drug evaluation unit, they rock. They're the ones who approved studies with MDMA, cannabis, Ibogaine, LSD. They greenlighted all of this in the last like 10 or 15 years. That unit was completely rebooted in the past. It used to just ban everything the DEA or Department of Justice told them to, whereas now they don't do any of that. They're actually doing what they're supposed to do, which is evaluating the benefit or harm of any given molecule. But there are other parts of the FDA that just suck, mm -hmm. and they're corrupt or they're incompetent. And the pharmaceutical industry within the United States is a gigantic mess. I mean, to bring one molecule to market which means oh hey this thing is something interesting in animal models so then let's see what else it does let's move it through phase one phase two phase three you know, clinical trials preclinical trials before that i mean to actually get that molecule into human beings in the marketplace is roughly five to seven years and uh one to 1.4 billion dollars per molecule and that's the ones that make it because there are a lot of them that they start this whole process and they don't make it. Mm -hmm. And so the the pharmaceutical companies need to make back their money somehow. Of course, yeah. At this, 
But at the same time, they're really just price gouging, taking advantage of individuals and making as much money as as possible because the purpose of any given pharmaceutical company is not to help people and cure disease. It is to generate revenue for the shareholders. And that's, that's within the U.S. I think in Canada, you have considerably different laws like companies cannot charge exorbitant amounts of money for uh, a given molecule for patients who need them it, how, how does it work where you're at it's really difficult to say because i don't enter the medical system very often and uh when i have been mostly buying drugs uh i mean pharmaceuticals it was yeah. when i was younger and when i was under my parents like insurance plan that was through uh, my father's company. Okay. And then as I've gotten older, I just haven't had a situation where I've really needed to do any significant, you know, pharmacological intervention that I, that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't voluntarily driven uh, right. by my own research that had nothing to do with sort of uh, going through the gateway of a general practitioner uh, physician. So, right. But so, uh, most things that happen in Canada are covered under uh, like federally funded um, insurance. And then pharmaceutical like prescriptions aren't covered under that. But then most people have health insurance on top of that, too. And so they end up getting um, getting their pharmaceuticals paid for. And I think that there might be some correlation between the government providing free healthcare and the uh, governmental oversight of price gouging on pharmaceutical drugs, because there's also, um, because I mean, obviously the government is concerned about making sure that people have access to affordable healthcare. And yeah. on top of that, depending on your situation, like for example, if I was, if I had a some sort of condition that made it so that I was going to fucking die if I didn't get a drug, uh, then it's not like I'm just like tough luck. I'm going sixty thousand dollars in debt, or I die. I can apply, and then the government will still pay for my pharmaceuticals. So, um, which is the case for uh, people with diabetes, for example, because insulin is is a prescription medication, right? So, or right. ultimately, yeah. Uh, so I couldn't I couldn't really say for sure. Although the government of Ontario recently passed a passed a um, a legislation that funds all prescription medication for anyone under the age of 25, um, which I think is great to some degree, but I was immediately questioning of that too. Is like, is that really the best we could be doing with our our money? Is to make sure that you know the dr the drugs that are still you know being bought off pharmaceutical companies uh are getting paid for so that more kids can just have like easy access to whatever drugs they need without having to worry about the concern of whether or not it's financially reasonable uh because if it's just free like why would you put that extra consideration as to whether or not you should give it to your child and at the same time i understand that there's a lot of like the middle class is quickly disappearing and there's a lot of people who are going to positively benefit from having free access to medication. But the full like complexities of how Medicare works in Canada is definitely beyond my scope. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in a similar situation. I mean, the how the healthcare system works for me as an individual within the United States is often beyond my scope because right. it's incredibly it's tangled up and confusing. And yeah. it's wait a minute, what, why am I paying so much money for this? And then you deny this, you deny the other. It's, it's awful. But I think America has the worst healthcare system of any non-third world country on earth. We, we, we basically suck. We, we, we fixed it a it's little bit. It's for your bit. liberty, we, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> we, we took a few steps in the right direction. And, you know, I, I, I don't know, but yeah, the, the 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 middle class to to put that in air quotes there is essentially gone. You're mm. you're either somewhere in the top five percent or you're poor and you have a very hard time affording uh, basic medical care. Uh, oddly enough, Mexico has a very reasonable healthcare system in comparison to the. Somehow, at this point, I managed to turn off the recording and then I turned it back on at some point afterwards. Uh, so that topic is dropped, but we start back up on another topic right away.
endless because we've we've covered a lot of different tangents, but to focus on one very small one that both of us, I think, participate in vaping. Um, it's uh, not not long ago. I think it's been about a year and a half, something like that. It was 2016. The Royal College of Physicians in the UK released their position paper on vaping. And to sum it all up and compress it, uh, the, the end result is that vaping, based upon what we know at the present time, vaping represents a 95% reduction in harm over combustion of tobacco and smoking cigarettes. And that was, that was their position, and they strongly encourage people to vape if you're going to do nicotine. And obviously, we don't have any long-term data because no one's been vaping enough for there to be any. Well, I'm participating in that current experiment fairly heavily. Yeah, exactly. Cheers, brother. Me, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's worked. I used to smoke two packs a day of cigarettes, and I, I started vaping in uh, in 2009 using you know mechanical mods, which was like the GG and the Super T. Those were like the big battery mods, and have gradually progressed through the years. And it's worked for me because I really. Uh, Ibogaine does reboot you off of nicotine, but I have discovered I really like nicotine because nicotine and caffeine enable me to sort of tune my consciousness and hit that state where I'm productive and I'm focused. But at the, at the same time that the UK uh, released this position paper, um, the FDA, meanwhile, wrote a bunch of hysterical garbage where they're essentially setting fire to five-year-old cartomizers that no one uses in that manner. It's like, okay, you pump eight watts through this cartomizer, it will start to smoke, and inhaling these fumes is bad for you. Well, yeah, but I don't know anybody who, who vapes by setting fire to their cartomizers and then inhaling burning plastic. You, right, you it kind of reminds me of that, that study from Oh God, I, I don't know the year, but it's a fairly famous study insofar as like famously poor science, which had to do with uh, uh, cannabis smoke causing brain damage or something. And they just put these rats in a, in a place and then just pumped it full of cannabis smoke to the point where in these things just like straight up couldn't breathe and had damage from oxygen deprivation and then said cannabis smoke fucks your brain up. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the joys of junk science. That's yeah. th that's the part that's disturbing about what you know the FDA does. And they, b based upon all this, they were going to literally you know ban vaping, just like put everybody out of business. This Jeez, was back I in twenty. For that, <laughs> that's uh, gee, it couldn't be the cigarette companies. Oh, no, no, um, no. oh wait, it could because because uh, every time you see a commercial that smoking is bad for you and the government wants you to to help you stop smoking, they actually don't. They want you to keep smoking and then later on in life participate in the extraordinarily profitable cancer treatment industry. Um, and what actually happened in the U.S. is tobacco bonds went down the toilet. For the first time in history, a lot of people just stopped smoking. There was an entire generation of kids who grew up and they vape and they've never smoked a cigarette in their lives. Yeah, and they don't care to. Yeah, exactly. And that doesn't help any of the states that are receiving funding from the tobacco bond settlement. And they're basically losing a lot of money, which motivated their actions to sort of lash out and try to ban everything. And of course, then Trump got elected and immediately switched the, the, the person who was the head of the FDA and their plans immediately switched over to, well, let's just do nothing for a couple of years and see what happens, hmm. which is a significantly better plan than banning everything. But that, that's, that's one large example of something that kills a lot of people. I mean, if, if you look at the top 10 causes of death, most of them uh, can be directly attributed to cigarettes, alcohol, or just not taking care of yourself at all, eating a really poor sure. diet, not getting any exercise, sugar. Yeah. Um, they, they, they all stem from that. And of course, accidental deaths, the leading cause of death for people under the age of 50, I believe it's actually now pushed to under the age of 60 is, you know, ODing on drugs as a 
you know. Well, oh, yeah, ODing on pharmaceutical drugs, yeah. Yeah, uh, th- that miracle product, Oxy. Um, that's, that's sort of... I, I heard that of, it's not addictive at all. You got to get over your opiate stigma, man. Like, Yeah. <laughs> I saw this great commercial. They gave me a free hat. They took me out to a cruise ship. They told me it's not yeah, addictive. Yeah, that- that that was that was uh, that was Purdue Pharmaceuticals who uh, seemed to have taken an entire chapter out of the Bear Corporation's initial marketing materials for their miracle product, which heroin. Right. You, you don't hear them taking credit for that one too often anymore. But well, I think they ended <laughs> up paying something ridiculous, like a tiny amount of money for false advertising, but like something like five percent of what they made profit wise that was getting an entire country just totally obliterated by opioids yes it, the, that they they it was one of the largest financial settlements in history that Purdue pharmaceuticals had to pay and initially there was uh i mean there were there were felonies there were criminal charges there were certain executives that were supposed to get indicted and possibly go to prison. Of course, nobody ever did. Everyone purchased their way out of that. And they did pay one of the largest fines Mm. in history for knowingly misbranding and mismarketing a molecule that they knew was addictive and just, well, lying about it. Um, And again, Bayer did the same thing when they introduced heroin. Heroin was initially introduced as a completely safe, non-addictive form of morphine. And, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, that may have been wishful thinking. <laughs> Perhaps was not true. Right. Uh, but the, the entire drug epidemic in the United States, I mean, it's the demographics have shifted considerably back from when I, when I was doing heroin. Now, the people that we treat It's literally somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 percent of them originally got strung out by their doctors who Mm -hmm. prescribed Oxy to them at a point in time where Oxy was just being thrown at everybody all the time. I mean, there are states within the United States that have more opioid prescriptions written than human beings living in the state. And that includes like children and babies. So it's just the numbers were ridiculous. There were just mountains of this shit being shoveled at everybody. And then the hysteria came and then, you know, the laws changed. And suddenly the same doctor that's been writing you all these scripts uh, can't do that anymore. And it's like, oh, sorry, that's, I, I can't write you for all these things you're addicted to. And magically enough, your your addiction does not go away just because your doctor won't right. write you. you got to find those opioids somewhere. And since yeah. nobody's getting that oxy, they're going to have to find something to replace that oxy, like heroin or you know, um, something even cheaper, something even easier to get, like fentanyl. Yeah, that that's 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 the big one right there. I mean, fentanyl is a mess. It's also a mess detoxing people off that because there's so many different kinds. Mm-hmm. Pardon me, I'm taking up another drink for a moment here. That's um, good. Also, you know, let's 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 round the corner on this a little bit uh, because this wasn't even supposed to be a podcast. We were just going to chat for a few minutes, <laughs> um, and let's let's kind of swing back around to what was it called? Metformin. Like fin- finish up what you were saying there about metformin and the E2, um, yeah, your E2 levels and uh, sort of getting back into a healthy endocrinology. Metformin, to, to sum it up, is something that is appears to be extraordinarily safe and it's incredibly cheap. I mean, you can literally buy a month's supply of metformin at a Walmart for about 4 or $5. There's uh, the single posi- the single possible negative aspect of it is lactic acidosis, which is a condition that happens very, very infrequently, and it usually stems from being extremely dehydrated. But as you're aging, uh, metformin is definitely one of the top anti-aging medications that we know about right now that appears to have a tremendous amount of efficacy across a wide spectrum of systems and uh, doing, you know, if you're not a type two diabetic and your A1C is relatively normal, your A1C measures 
it's basically like a load average for your blood sugar. So it's like one of those cool pieces of debug code that are left in our systems <laughs> because why, why is it there? Well, who knows, but it's really handy because it will give you the load average for the last couple of months of what, what's your blood sugar been like. And, uh, Metformin, low dosing it, let's say a gram per day, even if you're not type 2 diabetic, can have significant health benefits if you are in the process of getting older. So let me say, you know, 35 and up, 40 and up, or, or if you're just not taking very good care of yourself, which I guess represents a lot of people in America and other countries and, and Mexico where like childhood obesity is at all time highs and people are not doing that great. But, you know, metformin is definitely something to be aware of and investigate and educate yourself about. And it's also a molecule that many, many physicians will have no problem writing you a script for. And so it's what, is, what is its relationship to estradiol? Uh, none directly. <laughs> That's uh, uh, basically it's a part. It's a component of just rebalancing your whole system post drug use, which is one of the things that we try to do. It's, you know, you want to reduce inflammation. You want to bring the whole body back into a state where your foundation is solid. Uh, estradiol is something that strongly affects your mood, which is your levels of estrogen. And so estradiol is part of testosterone replacement. Um, you do not necessarily need to replace testosterone in order to adjust your estradiol. If your testosterone levels are normal, then a CIRM, such as Clomid, a CIRM is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, could help you bring it back into a normal range or an aromatase inhibitor. But basically, your estradiol is very... Uh, very much the knob that kind of like spins your mood and how you're feeling about life and how you're feeling about everything. And for men, the ideal range tends to be within about 20 to 30. And uh, that's that's part of like the basic blood work that you would want to look at when you are when you're looking at what have you got to work with when you've detoxed? I mean, basically, what state are you in? What is happening? Where where do you make the different adjustments? And just off the top of my head, uh, I mean, if, if you're doing Ibogaine, that's a whole other thing that we, we, we haven't even had those conversations yet. That's, that's for be, the official podcast. That's, yeah, that's the official later podcast. in the official podcast. Let me, yeah. let me spin this back to this one then. So, so essentially, what you would want to test, you'd want something like a comprehensive metabolic panel. You'd want a CBC with differential and your platelets, which just gives you an overview of where you're at. You want your testosterone level, both free and total. Uh, the free is the important one. You want a estradiol, which is an E2, sensitive. It must be the sensitive test because if, you're, if you get the regular test for estradiol, it does not work in men at all. It will mm -hmm. just return these very weird out-of-range values that, that don't mean anything. You want your uh, SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, you want to know what your DHEA sulfate is. You want your TSH, your LH. Uh, you want a lipid panel with your cholesterol ratios so that you know where where that's at. And uh, if you're a guy, you probably want prostate-specific antigens. So you just know if, uh, if you add testosterone, is that value changing? Is it going up or is it going down? And essentially, with all of these numbers, you can look at what is the ideal range, where are you at, and why are you feeling the way you are? Because your hormonal system really mediates your daily state of consciousness to a great degree. And it's like, okay, you, you can do therapy, you can do meditation, you can do entheogens, you can do all these different things. But then if you come back to the body that your consciousness resides within and everything's all fucked up, then it's set on like miserable. It's hard to break out of that unless you fix it. 
And I'm, I'm mostly talking here, I've, and, and what we've both discussed is as it pertains to men, because you know I'm a guy, and I'm speaking about my own experiences because, you know, I'm I'm 49, I'm going to be 50 years old, and I'm jacked, and this is all the different things that that I've dealt with. But it it for women, it's very similar, except instead of testosterone, you're dealing with estrogen itself and adjusting that so that your baseline levels are normal and you're also functioning in a state that is uh, conducive to maintaining happiness and positive health. Hmm. You know, this whole discussion about uh, testosterone and estrogen uh, kind of brought something to light. I've been really struggling with my quality of life, um, but not all the time, just like some days, and then for several days, and I thought maybe it was related to vitamin D3, because I am in like, like the final parts of the winter here in Canada. Uh, Well, I guess you're in in New York, right? So you're just, you're you're in the same place as I am. And just 22 inches of snow in the last 10 days. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But um, I've actually, so I've been on a ketogenic diet now for a little over two months. um, And it's been great, especially for my blood glucose levels and and dealing with um, hypoglycemia and no longer, basically no longer dealing with hypoglycemia because I don't need to. Uh, But I discovered this pop, this soda that has, it's like fasting neutral, you know, zero calories, zero grams of sugar, and it's all stevia. And since it's the only sweet that I can get, I've just been crushing this sweet. And... I understood that it had a negative impact on my testosterone levels, but I was like, oh, it's fine. I'll just take some Vitex and if I see boobs, I'll stop, you know? Uh, (laughs) But then actually thinking about it, it's like, yeah, it seems to be like my shitty days to my good days seem to be correlated with whether or not I ran out of this fucking stevia pop. uh, (laughs) Because like I had, I (laughs) I had like three over the last 24 hours and I was feeling low today and I didn't know what was up. I took some, uh, ashwagandha, which helps with t- testosterone production. Yeah. And all of a sudden I was feeling better. So that's a good insight. It's sad because I, I love sweet things and I don't want to resort to something that uh, might negatively impact my gut flora or make me flatulent like uh, xylitol or erythritol. But I certainly don't want to feel like a giant bag of shit. So maybe I'll have to just <laughs> dip back off that stevia a little bit. Thank you. Well, per- perhaps. I mean, it's, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're all human beings, and you're probably enjoying that, that thing that you're drinking, and it's probably producing some level of happiness. So oh, it's yeah. just balancing all that. I, I'm just curious. You mentioned keto, which I mean, how is your experience with that? You have a, lo- a lot of energy. You feel good. Everything is generally more positive and better for you. Uh, You know, it's difficult to say because I kind of stumbled my way into it, which is weird because typically getting into a ketogenic state and getting on a ketogenic diet, it's like a fucking marathon of dealing with your body's like (laughs) rampant, you know, craving for carbohydrates. But I kind of stumbled into it. I didn't really do any particular measures beforehand um, or take any time to really reflect on what I'm going through and what I'm thinking keto is going to offer. I was, I mean, primarily it was because I hoped that it would give me a more stable cognitive function, which it has. And I was also hoping that it would change my body uh, composition because I was feeling a lot of, um, I mean, it could be body dysmorphia, but I was having a lot of body image issues about how I was looking, especially on the front end of my torso, um, which was a result of my carb consumption, which included like sort of the tipping point was when I spent something like over $60 on pizza in three days just because I was lonely and it's winter, right? And I just love pizza. Thanks mom and dad and Ninja Turtles, you know, (laughs) Friday night pizza and, you know, Michelangelo, Donatello was my favorite. But um, so since I switched, I'm definitely, uh, my cognitive performance is definitely stronger. Uh, My hunger uh, situation at like a hanger situation, blood sugar levels, very stable. Um, previously, I would get depressed. I would get sad. I would get angry if I didn't eat after a few hours, where now it seems that I just start to get a bit tired and I could push yeah. through that tired as long as I want. I just won't be as on it um, until I eat again and then I'm not tired anymore. Uh, so that's definitely been a thing. 
but it's also been depending on how much water I'm drinking and whether or not yeah. I'm just like mega loading on salt. Cause I understand keto um, really, cause there's no sort of like holding the water cause there aren't carbohydrates in the system to do so. Uh, right. You know, I, I can dehydrate really fast and I lose a lot of my minerals. So if I'm not staying up on that, then my energy levels can be inconsistent. Um, I, yeah. I was so all, I was all just, in all it's it's been a great experiment like I miss things like I could just make keto pizza I have it's delicious you know I miss <laughs> some things but then when I think about it it's like what do I miss I miss being able to like not give a shit and just buy whatever the fuck I want and just eat it <laughs> and be like what oh man life sucks I want to watch Star Trek and eat pizza which I love doing right I just want to yeah. order some I won't you know I'll just say it. I'm not promoting this place, but here in Kitchener, like my favorite pizza is, is Peppy's. I just want to order fucking Peppy's and like go full grease mode, put it on my lap, sit myself right in front of the TV and watch Star Trek to hold back the tears until I'm too tired to stay awake and then just face tomorrow. I want to be able to do that. But then when I think about it, it's like, I don't <laughs> actually to want to do that. Like what? just because it tastes good, just because it crushes me, like it, it takes me out of my experience. Like I don't want to lose everything I've worked for just so that I could experience the sensation of carbohydrate in my mouth everything else about it is terrible yeah 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 i i personally i just i have personally never managed to stay on a, a ketogenic diet on for the long term i mean i basically follow a paleo diet mm -hmm. but really in my own case this amounts to i don't do sugar and i keep my carbs at let's say roughly 100 grams a day for mm -hmm. me um, that seems to work. That seems to produce very positive results. I have a lot of friends who do the keto diet though, who just think it's amazing and they stay on it and they stay in ketosis for months at a time and, you know, break out of that once in a while. But I was just, I was curious what your experiences were because, um, again, for me, just the, the complex carbohydrates do, they're, they're all right, but they're not so great. Simple carbs, no. Sugar, no. I, I just, I do all right if I hold my carb intake at like roughly 100 grams or less per day. Mm -hmm. And uh, metformin, that, that thing we're talking about before, that seems to dramatically impact how uh, carbohydrates get processed and what is actually happening with your blood sugar and what's happening with your body. It seems to produce a variety of, uh, of benefits in that regard. And, um, I mean, everybody, everybody is different. I mean, that's like going back to getting your, your, your genome sequence and just like, well, you don't need the full thing. I mean, the 23 and me version is perfectly fine. It'll give you a basic overview of, okay, here's your blueprint here. You, here's what could be going wrong. Here's how you could fix it with nutraceuticals. Here's what's what your strong points are. And, you know, but for me, uh, basically a paleo diet and, uh, not, not completely keto, but pretty close to that gives me really good results. So I was, I was very curious about you and you're saying essentially, you know, the same that you feel good on a keto diet. Well, it didn't see the other thing too, is like, I think I had this sense. I'm like, all I need to do is go keto and then it's going to fix everything. Right. Like, my problem is just that I, you know, have this blood sugar thing and I'm eating too many carbohydrates, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. But I mean, all my shit is still there. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> and, you know, like the, the desire to like not, not care and like my ADHD or well, ADD, because I'm not really hyperactive. I'm hyper distracted. But like a lot of that stuff is still there. I still have to, like, I still need to muster the gusto to, to move through it. But there's just a lot of physiological um, hurdles that would otherwise I would end up just like stumbling over and never making it to actually succeeding with what I had set forth for. I mean, obviously, to some degree, I have. I've been incredibly successful in accomplishing a lot of my goals over the last better part of a decade with my whole creative entrepreneurship. But um, the yeah, struggle that's, that's has when been... You when you mention that, it's like, yeah, I have ADD or I have this or here are all my failings. I just personally not, not having hung out with you and not having known you for years and years of time, just looking at your body of work, you're doing awesome, brother. Right. You're doing, <laughs> Thanks, you're, Patrick. you have a that, tremendous amount of self-discipline. You have a lot of ability to just regulate yourself. I mean, it's hard doing that and, mm -hmm. and you're doing a spectacular job. I really enjoy your work. So thank you. Yeah, you, thank you. You are overcoming whatever your flaws may be. <laughs> 
Thank you. Yeah. I mean, again, I, yes, thank you. I really appreciate that acknowledgement. And uh, also to finish what I was saying, it's like when I got to keto, um, it was like those physical hurdles weren't there. And so I, there was less standing in my way, but I, you know, I'm still always standing in my way. And so I, I always have to be choosing to step into my grander context rather than to quote a previous guest on the show, Shavoso Phoenix. I still need to choose to step into my grander context and not recede into my smallness. And that's an active choice that is easier or more difficult depending on the daytime date um, season, you know, whatever, like all the different factors. So I still have to choose that. It, keto certainly hasn't been a magic bullet, but my overall, I, I, I think it's one of the better dietary choices I've ever made. It's, it's about as, it's about as good as my decision to no longer be a vegetarian. Like that's, that's how great it was when I switched back over to meat eating that yeah. increased my health so much and decreased a lot of body pain and other issues so much. But then when I switched over into keto, it's like, I mean, even even better. I don't know where I'm going from here. It's like I could break it at any time. I've I fairly well adapted to fats, and I'm two months in. I mean, it wouldn't harm me to break it, but I have no reason to other than to experience the you know the sensation of carbohydrates in my mouth or you know macaroni and cheese just to experience it. I mean, I love it, you know. But uh, but yeah, so I have no reason to, to give it up just yet. I'm just I'm following the vibe as long. Uh, well. In the summertime, I'm going to end up traveling, and being keto and traveling as a backpacker is probably not possible. So, I'll likely, <laughs> that, I'll likely that, let that it go a few weeks hard. in advance. What was that? That would probably be difficult to do. I mean, possible, but it would be it would be more of a challenge. Yeah. Well, let's let's round let's round this out. Thanks for asking me, give, giving me a space to wrap off about my uh, ketogenic thing. This has been an excellent accidental podcast, and okay. um, <laughs> I look forward to speaking to you in a few days to record uh, record the official podcast and uh, and the addendum all in the same time. All right, it's it's been a pleasure, man, and I will speak to you in the very near term future. I hope you have a a great afternoon and evening. Cheers. Thanks for having me. And cut. Well, to say that I enjoyed that conversation would be an understatement. It is one of two so far interviews that uh, has happened with Patrick Krupa, the next one actually having video. So you'll uh, get to be able to enjoy that. Let's take a look at my schedule. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. In some time um, later than right now. And of course, if you're following me on social media, either at Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at James W. Gesso or following me on my newsletter, which you can find at bit.ly slash gesso newsletter, you're more likely to stay up to date on when the next episode with Patrick releases. Also, if you sign up for my newsletter, you get to have a free audiobook about my thoughts on working with psilocybin mushrooms as agents of psycho-spiritual maturation. Finally, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it either word of mouth with a friend directly in person or across that strange world of social media. You could also become a supporter of the podcast by checking me out on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso, or by leaving me a one-time PayPal donation or crypto donation. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Also, just generally appreciate that you listened. I... Yeah, if you didn't listen, I wouldn't have a reason to make this, other than the fact that it feels like my deep soul calling to produce this content for the world. But if you didn't listen, then, I mean, what would really be the point of it at all? So thank you for giving a shit. I will see you on the next episode of Adventures to the Mind. I'm James Gesso. Take care. At some point, I accidentally hit the turn off record button, and I didn't realize it. And I was like, shit, I'm pretty sure it was while I was talking, or it was like... When I go back, I'm pretty sure it was no more than two or three minutes, so I'm, I'll have to make a point about that. But uh, I was okay. like, oh, God, I'm glad I caught that <laughs> instead of just going we've, on. We've talked for, for quite around. a while, so if we lost two or three minutes, I don't think that humanity will suffer that much. Right, I don't know. Maybe that was the best bit, you know? Maybe it's like... It, it, it's possible, but so the two of us benefited from it, and we'll see what happens <laughs> hey, with the rest of it. Some things are only meant to be experienced once, perhaps, you know?